Grace and peace, everybody. Welcome to Sabbath School Study Group. This is part number three of our five-part series. And now we're going forward, not looking so much as the people or the individuals in Daniel chapter eight, but what and where are they doing what they're doing in Daniel chapter eight? We're talking about the cleansing of the heavenly sanctuary. But before we get to it, we want to pray that Father, in the name of Jesus, you'd please speak to our hearts. Amen. I'm so glad for Daniel chapter eight, because now we have these entities that are being shown to us through these animals that symbolize kingdoms, but then the leaders of these entities and the activity that they're doing even today. One of them is mentioned, that's the little horn. We see him, we met him in Daniel chapter seven, but he's echoed here and explained even further in Daniel chapter eight, but he's not the only one. He's not the only one in the spotlight. In fact, Jesus Christ identified in Daniel eight as this prince, he is also active in Daniel eight. And Daniel 8's activity shows us that Jesus is cleansing the sanctuary in heaven, even as the sanctuary on earth was cleansed. Jesus' cleansing of the sanctuary in heaven was typified, was modeled in what happened here in the earthly sanctuary. Daniel chapter 8, 14 says, And he said unto me, Unto 2,300 days, then shall the sanctuary be cleansed. This again is Daniel in vision. And in the vision, he sees people one peeking to another. And he says unto me in this explanation in verse 14, that in 2300 days, the sanctuary will be cleansed. Now, we know we're not just dealing with the earthly sanctuary, what some people call Moses' sanctuary, or even Herod's temple that was there when Jesus was alive, or even Solomon's temple that King Solomon built. These temples were reflections or models of the heavenly. Because the original sanctuary is where Jesus is working. Remember in Leviticus chapter 16, Leviticus 16 explained what they did in the model. In the model, in verse 33, it says that the high priest shall make an atonement for the holy sanctuary. And he shall make an atonement for the tabernacle of the congregation and for the altar. And he, the high priest, shall make an atonement for the priests and for all the people of the congregation. See, the high priest in the earthly sanctuary was a forerunner of what Jesus was going to do, not just for the whole congregation, but for the whole world. He was going to be the minister, ministering his own blood to affect atonement, righteousness for those who were unrighteous. He was going to save sinners. So this is like the, the courtroom of Christ vindicating us. This is the, the surgery room of him going in now and fixing what we broke when we rebelled. And what happened in the earthly sanctuary is that once a year, the sanctuary will be cleansed as the, the people of God would be working to, to make sure that they were not working to save themselves, but resting in the righteousness of Christ. They had to let go of their sins. They had to turn them over and give them to God to be atoned by his son, Jesus Christ. When that happened throughout the course of the year, in a way, these sins would accumulate in the sanctuary and they had to be cleaned out, cleared out. The books would be cleared out. And so here, this day of at one or the day of atonement, the high priest who, again, typifies Christ, would take all of those sins and cast them upon the scapegoat. But then at the same time, those sins would also be atoned for through the death of the other sacrifice. So you have this dual action where the blame is going back to whom it belongs. That goat symbolized Lucifer, Satan, the one who will be condemned for all the sin that we've gotten into. And then another animal, that goat would be sacrificed. And that sacrifice symbolized Jesus' Christ's death. The payment, the purchase of blood that the prince mentioned here in Daniel 8 uses to actually pay for our sins. See, this glorious gift of what happens here in Daniel 8, it tells us, even it echoes what Hebrews 9, 23 says. It was therefore necessary that the patterns of things in the heavens should be purified with these. But the heavenly things themselves with better sacrifices than these, than these on the earthly sanctuary. For Christ is not entered into the holy places made with hands, the temple here in the wilderness or the temple of Solomon or, or the temple of Herod. These are figures of the true. But into heaven itself, Christ, Christ now to appear in the presence of God for us. Jesus is there 
for us. He's not even there for himself. He's not even there just because he wants to be there. He is there because he wants us to be there. He is our ambassador. As a high priest who represented the people of God before God, this is Jesus Christ. One of us, the son of man, who is now standing as the son of God. That's why the idea and the, and the, and the reality, I don't want to say idea, the reality of what Jesus is doing for us right now is why you can be assured that whenever you pray and you ask for him to forgive your sin, he's not hanging on a cross. Christ is not in a crucifix. Christ is in the most holy place of the most high God, forgiving our sins, interceding for us, doing everything possible to make sure that you are not overcome, but that you're an overcomer. I'm glad to know that we have an active God. He's not just sitting on a throne, lounging, looking at us and just hoping we get our act together, but he's actively working to ensure that we have our act together because we've given our lives to him. We're trusting him as our salvation, him as our savior, and him as the one who is our only high priest. If you enjoyed today's lesson in prophecy, be sure to visit our website, changeministry.org slash the highway home. Here you're going to find two visual studies that guide you through every prophetic event from now until the coming of Christ. And you'll even find a step-by-step -step study that goes deeper into the word of God so that you can find both the peace and the power that comes from the promise of Jesus' return.